What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode, I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints on this Friday in the first week of Lent. We're continuing still through the Gospel of Mark and leaning on the faith of our fathers and catechesis of the church to deepen our Lenten devotion. Stick around. <music> So this Friday, as you've noticed, I'm only doing this Monday through Friday, we're drawing to a close on week one uh, of the, the season of Lent, this penitential time of the church where we reflect on our, our sinfulness and we reflect on the mercy of God in the life, the teachings, and the passion, the suffering and death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ in our place. So as Jesus tempt, was tempted after fasting in the desert for 40 days and said that we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, we too, during this time where we may or may not be fasting, we come to the word of God. So we're continuing in the Gospel of Mark, and we've got an incredible quote from Philip Melanchthon as we look back to that faithful cloud of witnesses that has gone before us. And of course, uh, we're going to follow up with some catechesis on the 7th and 8th commandment. So let's get started. Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, and when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about two thousand, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it to the city and in the country, and people came to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into a boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis, how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. Now, there's a lot that we could focus on with this reading, but I think uh, for this particular f devotion, for this focus, I want to look at how the things of God don't make sense uh, to anyone. Jesus does these things, and they make no sense, and Jesus works these great miracles, and it terrifies them he calms the storm <laughs> and they're afraid well we've seen him cast out demons we've seen him heal the sick we've seen him do all this good but my goodness he controls even nature and they were afraid he casts out this legion of demons and gives permission for them to enter into the pigs and the pigs are drowned of course the farmer has to be pissed and, and the city, just leave, leave, just go away. And heaven only knows their motives. He's, he's affecting their commerce. He's affecting their industry. He just, this crazy person that we've all become comfortable with. Now, it's terrifying to, after one encounter with you, to see him clothed and sitting in his right mind. 
This is how wonderful our Jesus is. That everything that he does for our greatest good is terrifying. But this God-man who can control the wind and the sea, who can cast out demons because he is God in human flesh, who ought rightly be terrifying to us, what does he say? Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Finally, this is God. This is who God always is and who he deigns to be. And this is why the Father sent the Son to be merciful to sinners. Now, we continue with our reading from the Augsburg Confession, written not by Luther, but by Philip Melanchthon. We teach that it is necessary to do good works. This does not mean that we merit grace by doing good works, but they are necessary and we should do them because it is God's will, Ephesians 2.10. It is only by faith and nothing else that forgiveness of sins is apprehended. The Holy Spirit is received through faith, Hearts are renewed and given new affections, and they are able to bring forth good works. Ambroth says, Faith is the mother of a good will and doing what is right. Without the Holy Spirit, people are full of ungodly desires. They are too weak to do works that are good in God's sight. John 15, 5. Besides, they are in the power of the devil who pushes human beings into various sins, ungodly opinions, and open crimes. We see this in the philosophers who, although they tried to live an honest life, could not succeed, but were defiled with many open crimes, such as human weakness, without faith and without the Holy Spirit, and when governed only by human strength. Therefore, it is easy to see that this doctrine is not to be accused of banning good works. Instead, it is to be commended all the more because it shows how we are enabled to do good works. For without faith, human nature cannot in any way do the works of the first or second commandment, 1 Corinthians 2.14. Without faith, human nature does not call upon God nor expect anything from him nor bear the cross, Matthew 16.24. Instead, human nature seeks the truth in human help. So when there is no faith and trust in God, all kinds of lusts and human intentions rule in the heart, Genesis 6.5. This is why Christ says, apart from me, you can do nothing, John 15, 5. That is why the church sings, lacking your divine favor, there is nothing in man, nothing in him is harmless. The Augsburg Confession, uh, Article 20, written by Philip Melanchthon. So, as we go through this Lenten season, and it's been a week how are we doing on our fast if we're fasting? Did we give up coffee? Did we give up donuts? Did we give up smoking? Um, <clears throat> are we skipping a meal throughout the day? Um, these works avail us nothing. And we should go into Lent knowing that these works avail us nothing. But Jesus says when you fast, not if you fast. So fasting and depriving ourselves of something to deepen our devotion on the word of God is a part of the Christian life. But Philip Melanchthon reminds us in the Augsburg Confession that these good works don't merit us anything. It is the suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ that empowers us to do good works. And it is the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that is our righteousness. That it is the blood and wounds of Jesus on Judgment Day that will be the appeal to God for a clean conscience. And Christ will show his wounds to the Father when we stand in judgment. And because of Christ, we will be declared righteous and be spoken to in such a way that says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Now... <laughs> Speaking of good works, let's get in uh, to our catechesis portion on the commandments. The seventh and eighth commandments. You shall not steal. God also wants property protected. He has commanded that no one shall take away from or diminish his neighbor's possessions. For to steal is nothing else than to get possessions of another's property wrongfully. Consider a manservant or maidservant who does not faithfully serve in the house, does damage or allows damage to be done when it could be prevented. He ruins and neglects the goods entrusted to him by laziness, idleness, or hate. 
to the spite and sorrow of master and mistress. In whatever way this can be done purposely, I'm not talking about what happens by mistake and against one's will, you can in a year steal thirty or forty florins. This is what is forbidden. To do our neighbor any injury or wrong in any conceivable manner by impeding, hindering, and withholding his possessions and property, or even to consent or allow such injury. Instead, we should interfere to prevent it. It is commanded that we advance and improve his possessions when they suffer lack. We should help, share, and lend both to friends and foes. Matthew 5.42 The Eighth Commandment You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Over and above our own body, spouse, and temporal possessions, we still have another treasure, honor, and good reputation. Proverbs 22.1 It is intolerable to live among people in open shame and general contempt. Therefore, God does not want the reputation, good name, and upright character of our neighbor to be taken away or diminished. The Eighth Commandment forbids all sins of the tongue, James chapter 3, by which we may injure or confront our neighbor. God prohibits whatever is done with the tongue against a fellow man. This applies to false preachers with their doctrine and blasphemy, false judges and witnesses with their verdict, or outside of court by lying and speaking evil. Here belongs the detestable, shameful vice of speaking behind a person's back and slandering, to which the devil spurs us on, and of which much could be said. For it is a common evil plague that everyone prefers hearing evil more than hearing good about his neighbor. Now, as we go back, <laughs> the, the seventh commandment, uh, you shall not steal, and the eighth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. If you've been watching this, this Lenten devotional series, you're noticing that there's two parts to the commandment. I pointed it out quite clearly on commandment one. There's a command portion, and then I also believe uh, a promise portion, where each one of these commandments uh, is a promise. So there is going to come a day with the new heaven and the new earth when these are no longer commands we must obey, but promises of the reality that will be the new heaven and the new earth. But you've also noticed there's two parts, what we're not allowed to do and what we should do. So not only should we not take away from our neighbor, but we should also help him to keep and maintain his possessions. Luther gives the example of a manservant or a maidservant being sloppy or lazy. Uh, in modern times, we could call this time theft or work avoidance, maybe. Uh, when we're at work, but we're not giving it our all or we're slacking off, that stealing. Uh, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The Eighth Commandment. Oh, we're really good at this one, aren't we? And oftentimes, I've even done it on this channel where I'm trying to mock an argument and end up mocking the person making it. It's there for anyone to see. I don't delete these videos. You can watch it. You can see it. We are to uphold the reputation of our neighbor. These, these commandments are familiar to us in American culture, aren't they? Life liberty, the pursuit of happiness. But again, as always stated during this penitential time of the season of Lent, where we reflect on these commandments and our inability to keep them. We repent of our sin and rest securely in the promise that the blood of Christ clothes us and is our righteousness. We pray. Lord Jesus, Son of the Most High God, you freed many from their bondage to demons, demonstrating your power over the evil one. Show us your mercy when we are overcome by the darkness of sin, death, and the devil. Protect us by your mighty word that does what it says. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Until next time, may God richly bless you and the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.